Hi everyone. Today I'll be presenting our work title Simple, Credible and Approximately Optimal Options with Max. This is joint work with Costas, Brendan and Vasilis. In this work, we prove the first revenue guarantees of non-truthful multi-item options. We also design the first static credible approximately optimal multi-item option. Let's start with some assumptions that we will be making in the rest of the talk. We will assume that multiple bidders participate in every auction. These bidders are individually rational, additive. They have independent asymmetric value distributions. These distributions are known to everybody. And however, the realized types of each of these bidders are private. We will also assume that the goal of the auctioneer is to maximize revenue. Let's consider this problem of revenue maximization. The revelation principle states that any mechanism can be implemented by a truthful mechanism. Therefore, much of the works have focused on designing truthful revenue optimal auctions. In 1981, Meyerson designed the best revenue optimal auction in the single item case. In the multi-item case, Kai et al. showed that given the explicit description of the bidder's distribution, it is possible to compute an optimal auction implementable in polynomial time. However, owing to the complexity of these auctions, several works have focused on designing approximately optimal truthful auctions which achieve a constant fraction of the optimal revenue. Although the revelation principle states that it is enough to focus just on truthful mechanisms, non-truthful mechanisms are still very common in practice. These mechanisms typically have simple payment rules, like you pay what you bid, which makes them easy to trust. We will deal with this trust issue in detail later. Therefore, this begs the question of whether non-truthful options are actually approximately revenue optimal. In the single item case, Hartline, Hoy, and Taggart show that if we assume that the bidder's distributions are regular, then even the simple first price auction with reserves is approximately revenue optimal. However, until now, such revenue optimality results have not been known in the multi item case, which is exactly what we do in this work. We prove the first revenue guarantees of non truthful multi item auctions. We build a simple class of entry fee auctions starting from a single item auction format A, which could be like second price, first price, or the all pay auction, we build a multi-item two tile of entry fee auction, where the auctioneer first sets some bidder specific entry fees and then runs simultaneous A auctions for all these items. The items are finally allocated to those bidders who accept and pay the entry fee. Let's look at a simple example, the entry fee first price auction. Say there is an auctioneer who wants to sell three items. There are three bidders who are interested in these items. The auctioneer now looks at the value distributions of these bidders, which could potentially be different, and then sets some specific entry fees for each of these bidders. The auctioneer also promises to toss some bias coin and then collect the entry fee, let's say if it turns heads, and not collect the entry fee if it turns tails. These bidders are going to submit bids for each of these items. Also, they submit a decision bid saying whether they want to participate in the auction or not, given that the auctioneer collects entry fees. Okay. Now the auctioneer, let's say, tosses the coin and it turns heads. And the auctioneer is going to run simultaneous first price auctions for all these items and then mark the winning bids. Those bids marked in red are the winning bids. Let's look at the allocations. For bidder one, she gets no item. Although she's allocated the second item in this auction, Still, because she was not willing to pay the entry fee, she gets nothing, she pays nothing. Bidder two, she wins item three and pays her bid, which is 225 for the item, along with the entry fee that was set by the auctioneer. Bidder three wins item one and similarly pays her bid and the entry fee. Notice that in this auction, though item two was allocated to bidder one, it gets discarded in the end. All right, here's our main theorem. If A is a single item auction such that, at equilibrium, Every bidder does not bid more than her value and her payment is also at most her bid, then optimal revenue is bounded by a constant factor of the revenue of selling items separately by a Myerson auction plus twice the revenue of the EA auction. Observe that the condition which I stated in red easily holds for the second price, first price, and all pay auctions, and here are the constants that we prove. A very interesting corollary of this is Let's say we apply the result by Hartline et al. for when the bidder's distributions are regular. Then we can replace the Myerson auction by separate first price auction with reserves. What this shows is that a hybrid auction, which randomizes between selling separately items via first price auction with reserve and 
the entry fee, let's say all pair or the first price option is going to be approximately revenue optimal. This hybrid option is also non-truthful. Another interesting consequence of our main theorem is credibility. Roughly, an auction is said to be credible if auctioneer has no incentive to lie. What, these mean, what this means is that in these auctions, bidders can actually trust the auctioneer to abide by the rules of the auction. Let's take a simple example. In the single item case, the truthful second price auction is not credible. Say there is an auctioneer, there are two bidders interested in buying this item. However, the, although the auctioneer is gonna allocate the item to the green bidder who bids the largest value, she can still lie and say that the payment for this bidder is actually 99 and create a fake bid, which is 99, but this green bidder would not be able to detect that. So this auction is not credible. However, we can see that these simple non truthful auctions like first price and all pay are credible. In this work, we show that this extends even to the multi-item case, that is the separate first price auction is credible. Also, the entry fee all pay auction that we design is also credible. Therefore, combining these two, we show that the hybrid auction, which I just described in the previous slide, is credible and also approximately revenue optimal. In the next half of the talk, Max will discuss the techniques involved in the proof of the main theorem. So yes, Sachi, thank you for introducing our results. And I'm here to talk a little bit about the math behind the results because you know, we all love some good mathematics, right? Now, uh, in the discussion of the revenue of auctions, uh, the conversation should always begin with the work of Meyerson from the 1980s. And he establishes this notion of virtual value, which we denote by phi of t here. So a virtual value of a bidder in an auction is going to essentially be a function of their valuation or type denoted t and the prior distribution from which this type is sampled from. And the whole accomplishment of his work is that the expected revenue of an auction can be shown to be equal to the expected virtual welfare. That is the expected virtual value of the bidder who's allocated the item. And you know, this gave us for the first time an ability to understand auction revenue. But the biggest limitation of it is that it only works in the single dimensional setting. It is for say single item auctions. So for this multi-item result, we're gonna need some, some modern technology. Flash forward to the past 10 years, Kai, Devonor, and Weinberg extend this notion of virtual value to the multi-item setting. Okay, so to a certain extent, which I'll explain in a little bit. But if we're in a multi-item setting, so selling different items in a single auction, now our type is going to be a vector. It's gonna be how much we value each single item. And the definition of multidimensional virtual value will be in terms of this Meyersonian single dimensional virtual value. Essentially, we're just gonna take one of these terms, in this case, T3, and replace it with its single dimensional virtual value. How do we determine which of these terms gets replaced? It's determined by a partitioning of what we call the type space into regions. So in this little diagram, I'm considering an example where we have a two item auction and how much we value each item is somewhere between zero and one. So the total type space is going to be the set of vectors in this little unit box here. And we partition it into two regions, R1 and R2. And essentially all I'm saying is that if we have some type T1, T2 belonging to region one, then its virtual type will be phi of T1, T2. Essentially the term that gets replaced corresponds to the region to which we belong. And what we're concerned with are what are called upwards closed regions. These are regions such that for every single point in region one, all of the other points in the increasing R1, uh, item one direction will also belong to R1. And similarly, all the points in R2 in the increasing type two direction will all belong to R2. And as long as every single region satisfies this property, we say the regions are upwards closed. And the whole point of their work is to say that if we define this multidimensional virtual value in terms of upwards closed regions, then we can say that the expected revenue is going to be at most the expected virtual value. We don't have a quality here like we do in the single item setting, but remember, it's a much, much crazier problem to understand optimal revenue in the multi-item setting. So this is a result that we expect. Okay, the first big idea that me and Sachi had was to redefine these regions in terms of the interim utility of separate A auctions, okay? So what do I mean by this? So we're considering a hypothetical scenario, in which case we're selling each of these items separately by an A auction. And the A auction could be second price, first price, all pay, whatever, okay? And essentially each bidder can look at their type vector and realize and compute their expected interim utility that they would receive participating in each of these auctions over the randomness of everybody else's type, right? And essentially we just say that, you know, my type vector belongs to region J if item J is the item on which I would achieve the greatest interim utility. And the, the, the biggest point of this was that essentially, regardless of what the A auction is, truthful, non-truthful, whatever, we can show that interim utility is a quantity that monotonically increases in type which means that uh, this will lead to upwards closed regions no matter what A is. All of the past work defined these regions in terms of ex post utility, which is only monotonically increasing for certain truthful auctions. So this is the first step 
to achieving non-truthful stuff. All right, let's talk about some inequalities, right? So we've established our regions, and so we can say that the revenue of the revenue optimal mechanism is upper bounded by the virtual welfare of that mechanism. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this virtual welfare term, break it up into little pieces, and we're gonna bound each of these pieces by the revenue of a simple auction. And then putting that all together, we'll show that all these simple auctions together will upper bound the revenue of this optimal auction, and that will give us what we're trying to get. Okay, so let's consider the virtual welfare contribution coming specifically from item J. And we're gonna break this into two cases, okay? And again, we're gonna to return to this hypothetical scenario in which case we're selling item J separately via an A auction. The first case is that the person who gets allocated item J in this revenue optimal auction is the exact same person who would have won item J in this hypothetical A auction. And the other case is that it gets allocated to a hypothetical A auction loser. <laughs> now, the terms coming from case one are relatively straightforward, not too important. Essentially, it breaks into one further case where, let's say bidder I is the person who wins item J in this revenue optimal auction. Um, then we see that depending on uh, what bidder I's uh, virtual type vector is, this will either contribute a five TIJ term to the virtual welfare or a TIJ term to the virtual welfare, right? So that would be, is item J the term that gets replaced in bidder I's type vector? Okay, now the total contribution summing over all of the items of these five TIJ terms is going to be at most the revenue of selling these items separately via Myerson auctions. In the worst case, this is just gonna be the largest virtual value for each item summing over the items. Myerson's auction, crazy stuff. And similarly, this, the total contribution from all these TIJ terms is, is gonna be boundable too. Um, essentially, either the TIJ term isn't that large, in which case we can bound it, or it is very large. But remember, this wasn't the term that got replaced in bitter eyes type vector, meaning that there would have to be an item that had even larger interim utility than item J, and that happens with small probability when, I, when TIJ is large. Cool, so this whole first case, not too relevant. Also, all of this decomposition occurs in previous work. But then case two is where things get interesting. We're considering an allocation to an A auction loser. And in the worst case, what this will contribute to the virtual welfare is the value of the highest type bidder who loses the A auction, hypothetically, and who we refer to this person as the biggest loser. Now, when the highest type bidder wins, that makes the, sec the biggest loser going to be the second highest type bidder. And we're going to be able to capture the second highest type through revenue, namely using the second price auction. But things get a little bit interesting when we're talking about non-truthful auctions, like for the first price auction. We know that the first price auction experiences an amount of welfare loss. That means that with some probability, the highest type bidder is not going to win, making that bidder the biggest loser. And moreover, we know that we can't capture the highest type through revenue, right? That's, I mean, that's the whole point of auction theory, right? So it seems like there could get complications here when we're dealing with an A auction that has welfare loss. So if you've lost track of what I'm saying thus far, I've got wonderful news for you. You can tune back in right now because essentially we've showed that the core of the problem boils down to showing that the welfare loss of our A auction is going to be upper bounded by a constant fraction of the optimal revenue, right? And so we're gonna specifically look at our analysis for the first price auction. So the welfare loss of the first price auction welfare of second price minus welfare of first price. We want to show that it's going to be at most some constant fraction of the optimal revenue, the revenue of Meyerson's auction. So there are some price of anarchy guarantees that the welfare of the first price auction isn't so bad, right? We can show that it's at least an E minus one over E fraction of the optimal welfare. But that still means that in the worst case, the uh, welfare loss of the first price auction is gonna be a constant fraction of the optimal welfare, a one over E fraction. And moreover, in the worst case, there are cases where the optimal welfare can be arbitrarily worse than the optimal revenue. And it seems like when both of these worst cases come together, all hope is lost. The welfare loss of the first price auction is not attainable through revenue, and, and we just have to give up on non-truthful auctions. But that's when me and Sachi realized that no matter what we're dealing with, both of these worst cases can't coexist. Whenever the first worst case holds, the second one doesn't, and vice versa. And we exhibit this through a really beautiful geometric duality that I'm really happy to tell you guys about. We call it the box lemma. So let's talk about first price auctions, okay? In a first price auction single item, if we have a type T and I place a bid B, my utility in that auction is going to be type minus bid, the potential profit I make if I win, times the probability that I win, right? The probability that my bid wins is the probability that everybody else's bid is less than my bid, right? So that means that we can actually understand this interim utility quality, uh, quantity rather, in a graphical sense. If we graph the cumulative distribution function of the maximum of everybody else's bids, and we plot my type T along the x-axis, we can essentially show 
that the utility I achieve in this auction is going to be the area of a box that we can fit underneath this curve. If my bid is according to the left side of this box, then essentially the width of this rectangle will be type minus bid, and the height will be the probability my bid wins and everybody else is below me. So right, if I bid far below my type, you know, I, I set myself up for a big profit, but I only win with a small probability. If I bid right below my type, you know, I'm going for a small profit, but I have a good chance of winning. And so the way that bidders will optimally bid in practice is going to be to find the largest box that we can fit underneath this curve in area. Now let's take something that's seemingly a tangent and discuss the posted price mechanism. The posted price mechanism is essentially the auctioneer is just going to set a price R and I'm like, hey, anybody who's willing to pay R, you get the item, you pay R. What's the optimal way to set this price R? It's going to be R times the probability that uh, at least one person is going to pay R, that the maximum type exceeds R. That's going to be uh, maximizing that quantity will be the optimal way. And we can also understand this graphically, graphing the CDF of the max type as the largest box that we can fit above the curve. And the whole point of this duality is that no matter what type distribution we're working with, either this largest box below or this largest box above has to be large. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Now, it's important to notice that we're not talking about the exact same curve, but importantly, in the first price auction, there's not gonna be any overbidding, right? I never bid more than I actually want the item. And so that means that the bid distribution will be distributed further back than the type distribution. And that means that the largest box underneath the bid curve will be larger than the largest box underneath the type curve. So U prime is a lower bound for U. And so looking at both of these boxes on this max type curve, essentially with just like a little bit of simple calculus, we can show that the square root of the biggest box above the curve plus the square root of the biggest box below the curve is going to be at least the square root of the type vector. Um, and so that is exactly what we need to establish this duality. So if we're in a case where the first price auction behaves really poorly, right? The utility each bidder receives is a very small fraction of their type and there's a lot of welfare loss. Then essentially that'll be the exact case when the revenue of the posted price mechanism is large, comparable to the optimal welfare. And similarly, when we're dealing with a case where the posted price mechanism behaves really poorly compared to the optimal welfare, that's exactly the case when bidders receive a large amount of utility relative to their type in the first price auction. And there's very little welfare loss. And putting these two things together, we're able to show that the welfare loss of the first price auction is at most four times the revenue of the posted price mechanism. Exact same logic holds for all pay auctions. Um, and then putting this all together, we're able to bound all these terms coming from case two by four times the revenue of selling the items separately by a posted price mechanisms. And then we can in turn bound that by separate Meyerson mechanisms because that's just even better revenue. And that's it. Any questions?